Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, my only French word. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the nice presentation and to Jean Leluc and all the organizer for the nice invitation. It is really a honor for me to be here. I was not there 10 years ago. I hope to be there in 2028. Uh, we'll never know. But I feel a monkey on my shoulders this morning because uh, I feel obliged to give you something. I guess you are expecting something from this lecture to uh, bring something with you for Monday morning. So uh, I decided to set the pace since the beginning and to start strong. The conclusion first. <laughs> so then you could decide to turn on your smartphones and do something else or to follow the outline through the general framework of Braxis, through the literature, how to get deeper into the relationship of Braxis with uh, toothwear, temporomandibular disorders, and even some pills of the relationship, possible relationship with complications around dental implants, to wrap up some message for the future, especially for the clinical researchers that are expecting us in the future, and to provide you with some more elaborate conclusions uh, to end this lecture. As far as me, uh, my close relationship with Braxton started during my graduation years. Uh, the academic pressure, you are forced to look at your future, but honestly, I felt in love with Braxism because it was the argument of my thesis. My graduation thesis was based on the relationship between the psychological factors and the temporomandibular disorders, uh, and of course, Braxism was part of it. And my very first publication in English language was dedicated to Braxism. Of course, then I married at 24, so uh, I experienced Braxism very early in my life. My canin went lost. <laughs> pretty early, uh, but that's part of life. Uh, almost 20 years later, I'm still here, happily married, thanks God. Uh, and I'm here to chew about the clinical consequences of Braxism. Which Braxism? The real question should be, which Braxism? We have seen yesterday with the nice lecture from Sandro that mm, it is not enough to speak about Braxism as a general entity that may have or may not have clinical consequences. As researchers, but also as clinicians, we will likely end up with a bunch of flies on hands if we try to correlate Braxism as a whole to uh, a specific uh, uh, possible consequences. So after 20 years, uh, as far as my other uh, field of uh, work is concerned, temporomandibular disorders, I matured the convincement that most debates are dentist-centered fictions. Occlusion, as researchers, we know that the focus has shifted to artificial pain, to the chronic pain issues, so to complex themes for our everyday life. But for Braxism, it's not the same. And the main message for you to take home is that to really try understanding the clinical correlates of Braxism, we should first understand that on the one hand, we have Braxism as a behavior, but that's not enough. Because when we have uh, Mademoiselle Marie on Monday morning in our office uh, with toothwear or with pain in the morning in, jaw, in the jaw muscles, it is not enough to tell her, Mademoiselle, you have a behavior. It is something like saying, uh, Mademoiselle, uh, you have something biological, a bit of, of uh, psycho, and the social issue like a Parmesan, uh, when we try to, to sell the biopsychosocial theme uh, as a framework to treat patients. That's not enough. It is an umbrella term, which is good for us as researchers, but Coming back to Braxism, we should understand that Braxism is not a single entity. So it is good that we are trying to understand uh, it as a behavior, but we should also have uh, well clear in our minds that Braxism is not a single entity. Oh, sorry. It is an umbrella term 
which groups together all these kind of motor activities. We got the teeth grinding, we got the teeth clenching, we got the habits of keeping the teeth in contact during the day with very uh, low profile, low intensity um, motor activity. We got the mandible bracing, which means keeping the muscle tense while focusing or con concentrating our activities. This is an important activity in terms of load over the temporomandibular joints, in terms of fatigue of our motor neuron fibers. And we got mandible thrusting, which by definition is the analog of grinding without keeping the, uh, the, the teeth contact. And then, just to make things a bit more complicated, we got the circadian rhythm. So we have bruxism during sleep, and we have bruxism while awake. So the first thing to do to really try correlating <coughs> bruxism with possible clinical consequences is to understand that we don't have one bruxism. And that's why all the attempts uh, we, as researchers, have made over the past years to correlate one-to-one -one bruxism with some consequences, especially as far as sleep bruxism is concerned, uh, has fell short. Because the cutoff we have seen so many times during these two days of Congress were described for research purposes. And then many of us uh, start using them to identify the possible clinical consequences of Braxism, but that's not the original inten intention of Gilles and the co-workers. And they also seem to be too sensitive because created in selected populations for research purposes, for screening purposes, to really identify the amount of individuals who Brax in the general population. There's an amount of literature on the topic. Some of the papers using proxy of polysonography, electromyographic assessment with portable devices uh, uh, we have just seen, it may be a very good proxy of what our muscles do during the night with respect to the use of polysonography. So we lost the neurophysiological correlates of bruxism, but we have the electromyographic signals. And the number of events uh, in terms of electromyographic activity is not so different between individuals with tooth wear or muscle hypertrophy, morning pain, and whatever you want, and individuals who don't have it. And we are approaching to show that the number of events at the general population level may be higher than expected. So as a general framework, we should understand that for sleep bruxism, polysonography is obviously the standard, but the st standard should be try measuring the amount of muscle activity to try uh, understanding the possible clinical consequences of bruxism as a source of motor activity. And as for awake bruxism, we basically don't know anything. Thanks, Emmanuel. I don't see him. Thanks for showing this newly approach uh, to, to the real-time evaluation of awake praxis, we firmly believe in it because we have to try uh, uh, investigating normality, the frequency and the prevalence of the behaviors and of the motor activity over the night in otherwise healthy individuals. That's what we put in the new consensus paper, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is only from then that we will be able, if any, to find the clinical correlates of all those activities. Of course, I'm not without sins, so I cannot throw the first stone. We also have used uh, uh, the criteria to try correlating uh, them with the possible clinical consequences, but it is obvious that uh, uh, there's a poor agreement with clinical findings. Even if we use, uh, the, in my mind, the best available device to, to really identify the number of events and the type of uh, contraction during the night. So the story so far, uh, of course, from a dental perspective, we have always been taught that uh, 
tutor is a sort of patognomonic sign of Braxism. On the other hand, there has been the neurological perspective uh, that tells us that Braxism is much more than tutor. There are neurophysiological correlates. Uh, uh, Gilles' group uh, in Montreal, Frank's group in, uh, in Amsterdam, and many others have worked on the topics of the neurophysiological correlates of the motor events over the night. But the real issue is that if uh, we look at this kind of PSG trace, we don't know anything about the possible clinical consequences and the clinical correlates and if the patient is in a treatment demanding condition. So the future will need to shed light on the discrimination between bruxism as a physiological behavior and as something that even if being a behavior may have clinical consequences. Browsing the literature, so you won't be surprised by the fact that uh, if we assess the, the, the purported clinical signs and symptoms for Braxism, there are no very concrete messages you can grasp from. Uh, we can try relying on footwear, we can have PMJ and jaw muscle pain, we can have muscle muscle hypertrophy, hyperkeratosis, the alba line, or the buccal, buc buccal mucosa ridging. We can have the soreness of hypersensitivity, the exostosis, the tori on the mandibularis or the palatal bone surfaces. We can have some uh, uh, periodontal signs of uh, ligament thickening, uh, hypercementosis on the x-rays. We can have signs on the oral appliance, we can have hypothetical signs of bruxism in individuals with complications around prosthodontic treatments. Someone in the past suggested that occlusion may be a marker of uh, bruxism. We now know it isn't true. But anyway, how to balance the information coming from the literature? The true message is that we, we have no uh, concrete message for you. I'm really sick and tired of reading systematic reviews and meta-analyses, grasping nothing, just because made by individuals without a clinical expertise in the topic they are reviewing. They use the cutoffs because someone has told them that the standard of reference is polysonography. They didn't find anything. They put odd ratio in the results. But the real issue is that more than 95% of our knowledge concerning the clinical consequences of bruxism is based on studies which has been, have been performed with self-reported approaches. And with the miscellaneous of self-reported approaches. Time frame, intensity, frequency, how many nights per week, the bad part in this world, many possible questions that, of course, may have many different explanations for the finding with the trade. So when we have such a low uh, level of validity in our knowledge, even the meta-analysis and the systematic reviews, which are really easy to publish, believe me, because they are an artifact in some cases, are biased at a certain extent. And so the first thing to do as clinical researchers and also as reviewers of journals, uh, as editors of journals, is to uh, uh, shifting the clinical practitioners and the clinical researchers to the concept that we have to discriminate between the bruxism activities before selling something to the communities. And that's why the literature on the less important, let me say, markers is not conclusive. Uh, there's a possible association with oral Tory. Uh, it is 
more conclusive, more definitive uh, as far as the absence of relation with periodontal consequences uh, uh, is concerned. But if we want to get deeper into other topics, we'll see them in a few minutes, uh, we should understand that there is not a linear relationship between bruxism and the purported uh, clinical signs and symptoms. So uh, the use of cutoffs to discriminate you are a Bruxer, you are not a Bruxer, are good for research purposes, but before introducing them in the clinical setting to try understanding the possible clinical consequences, there is a gap to close. And to close the gap, hypothesis grieving, given and um, individualized studies should be performed by using artificial intelligence approaches, by using multiple regression models to uh, mine our data. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, looking at your lecture, Emmanuel, I had the idea to, to prepare some sort of uh, um, multiple regression study to identify a cluster of clinical signs and symptoms that may define the bruxism individual. Th that's an option in the future, and, and no, no one has uh, done that before. Okay, but first, we have to understand that we should be able, as the gold standard, to measure the, the intensity of the motor activity and to assess the frequency uh, uh, of the behaviors during wait time for the two different uh, circadian manifestations of Braxis, sleep and awake. How to get deeper into the issue of the more frequently uh, purported clinical uh, signs and symptoms. Let's start with toothwear. We know from the literature that toothwear, in association with report of tooth grinding, may be helpful to discriminate between subjects with and without polysonographically diagnosed sleep braxis. Uh, there's no uh, concrete relationship with the severity of sleep braxis, but the clinical relevance of the toothwear cutoffs uh, is doubtful because of the decimal, in, in terms of uh, decimal points uh, um, difference in, in terms of being a bracer or of not uh, for toothwear. So it, it is hard to introduce these cutoffs in the clinical. So the best uh, we can say is that toothwear is not patronymonic of braxis, and we should of course, uh, reason in terms of differential diagnosis. But when the relationship with the possible clinical consequences of tutor in terms of medical consequences, we have to rely on the best available evidence. And in our 2010 review, together with Frank, we found very complex findings. I remember them like it was now, very crazy review, 26 pages uh, published in the Triple O Journal. And the only uh, concrete finding was that toothwear is not related with temporomandibular disorders pain. And to me, it makes much sense We'll see it in a few minutes. But what I'm trying to say for you as dentists is that when you see a patient with toothwear, please consider that toothwear is not a medical problem, and toothwear is otherwise, should otherwise be viewed as a, a prosthetic challenge. But toothwear doesn't have any uh, uh, consequences in terms of uh, overload of the jaw muscles uh, or, or loss of vertical dimension, so we have TMJ pain or uh, whatever uh, you want. The second possible consequences to, to get deeper into is the failure of restorations. We have seen yesterday with Sandro Pala's lecture that uh, basically we have nothing to uh, in our hands to be certain that Braxis could be a risk factor for uh, uh, implant supported or even prosthodontic restorations. And I remember that uh, when I 
was invited, uh, it was 2012, if I remember well, to the European Association of Austrian Integration uh, mega uh, consensus conference as a Bruxism expert to, to, to uh, present them uh, a systematic review on the role of Bruxism in, as a risk factor for dental implants. I was really surprised by the poor quality of the literature because basically we ended up with more than 20 papers in the dental implant literature concerning the issue of bruxism as a possible risk factor, but all of them, without any exception, were based on a very single item in the anamnesis of the patient. Are you a bruxer, Anton? Are you a bruxer? Uh, uh, Emmanuel, uh, does your wife tell you, Frank, that you are grinding your teeth during the night? Uh, that's uh, have nothing to do with being or not being a practice. And the implant literature is based on that. That's why I'm personally disturbed by meta-analysis concerning all these data meshed together. We have just seen one on the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. So, from a clinical viewpoint, it is quite obvious that when we have ceramic failures, uh, the possible uh, result is a, a multifactorial manifestation. But trying to assess the literature, I was not happy with myself coming to, the, uh, to an audience of over 1,000 implantologists in Europe uh, listening to myself saying, oh, we have no data. That's good for me, because I was paid to present that, but not so good to, for them to, 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 to have a message for the, the, the daily home. So the best we could do was to split the, the available literature into two groups of papers concerning the biological complication around dental implants, uh, so fundamentally implant survival, uh, loss of periodontal attachment, and all this stuff. 14 papers, basically no relationship in terms of bruxism as a potential risk factor. But the only few, very few, four papers uh, suggesting that bruxism may be a risk factor for uh, implant-supported complication concern the mechanical complications. So uh, uh, screw loosening, ceramic fractures, implant fractures. So the literature, the, 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 the bruxism part of the literature still remains really poor because based on the self-report. But we were trying to grasp something. So maybe your patient may experience more ceramic fra fractures uh, if uh, he or she is a Bruxer. But the core concept is that you have to measure it. Diagnosis is the first step, okay? Never forget it. And if you have a weak diagnosis, you cannot go on with your hypothetical uh, uh, reasoning line or thought or whatever you want. The third consequence is are temporomandibular disorders. In terms of uh, the umbrella term, grouping together, temporomandibular joint pain, internal delangement, of course, and myofascial pain of jaw muscles. In our 2010 review, we literally became crazy to assess the papers on the topic because we had, on the one hand, the literature on self-reported praxis showing us that there was an association with temporomandibular disorders. And on the other hand, we had very few papers, to be honest. I, I remember four papers at the time on PSG diagnosis of praxis suggesting us that there was no correlation at all, or at least that the findings were controversial and even not consistent between each other. And now I realized that that was an obvious finding in terms of uh, uh, circular reasoning. Because if you approach the patient with self-report or even clinical uh, 
uh, attempts to diagnose braxis based on, for instance, the presence or, or the self-report of pain in the morning, pain in the morning is also likely to be one of the uh, um, history taking signs of temporomandibular disorder. So there's a mental loop as a sort of circular reasoning. And it is surprising that 15 years later, the, the, this 2003 publication in the Journal of Phenomandibular Practice is so far maybe, I, I, I didn't check my H index uh, recently, but maybe it is my most cited publication. And it is completely uh, out of date and it makes no sense for me now, okay? So that's for the self-report. And for the, the PSG part of the literature, it is quite logical that thanks to what we know about the pain adaptation model, we have a sort of uh, uh, decrease, or may have a sort of decrease in muscular activity once that pain onsets. And so the correlation between PSG braxis, even if we measure it, and temporomandibular pain may be controversial because it may finally depend on the time onset of pain, for instance. So, this kind of circular reason reminds me of, uh, in Italy, we got a, a, a TV television uh, transmission called Super Quark. A and uh, uh, I remember of hearing uh, this geological loop according to which the, the um, ground strata are dated because of the fossils they are contained in it, and the fossils are dated because of the strata in which they are contained. So, it is really nice, so we are uh, not so certain about the, the, uh, all these procedures. And the same kind of uh, circular reasoning, uh, if you think about it, uh, applies to many uh, concepts we are uh, um, chewing up as Braxism experts. So what's on? What's happened after 2010? Uh, we are, again, reviewing the literature with a bit of difficulty, <laughs> together with Frank and other, let me say, fans. Um, the conclusion seems, on the one hand, be, uh, to be still valid, but it is not a good news. But it is an obvious news, because unless we are able to apply these very basic concepts of pain adaptation to our clinical way of reasoning concerning praxis, uh, we will end with a bunch of lies in our minds. So my proposal for the relationship, for the study, not for the relationship, to be honest, of the relationship between praxis and pain is that we should m measure the amount of muscle work in terms of continuum motor activity, root main square, uh, um, muscle load in terms of work, not in terms of single event, relate it with the time because at a certain moment in time, we have seen yesterday with Sandro, there will be pain or at least fatigue onset in one individual's uh, muscles. And at that time, we are not going to have a further increase in EMG activity. That's why all those fancy theories concerning the electromyographic use at chair side are not sensible from a clinical viewpoint because they are based on the vicious circle theory, which was good in the 50s, but not almost 70 years later. So uh, once pain onsets, it is likely that the amount of muscle work stop increasing, and sooner or later we'll have a decrease because of uh, uh, the uh, exertion of muscle fibers. And we'll enter, probably, in the chronic pain area due to uh, genetics, chronic sensitization, or whatever you want, and that's matter for pure research. So the relationship between braxis and temporomandibular disorders uh, should be viewed as the consequence of the amount of work made over a certain period of time. 
So it is not surprised that in 2012, Karen Raphael and Gilles and the group found no correlation between the number of events, PSG events, and uh, temporomandibular pain. But they found a very interesting uh, result a year later showing that the background activity, which is basically a sort of analog of uh, uh, the low intensity activity, constant, prolonged, tonic, isometric activity, moderate level activity is concerned. This is the kind of activity that may lead to exhaust our muscle feedbacks according to the Cinderella hypothesis. And we have the data. So to wrap up, research so far has failed because we were not being able to provide you as clinicians, I'm a clinician too, by the way, uh, uh, to discriminate between the different bruxism activity. They may have different clinical consequences, if any, but for sure, on the left of your screen, you will have a prolonged tonic isometric activity. It's something like keeping uh, uh, a bag or a weight or whatever you want with your biceps uh, uh, contract over the same length for a long period of time. And it is completely different from the single burst, single, sorry, event uh, of RMMA. We have considered patognomonic of sleep braxmin so far. So there's nothing wrong with the right side of your screen, but it is only one part, one piece of the puzzle. And we, and it is difficult, should be able to measure the muscle work if we really want to correlate it more concretely with the possible clinical consequences. So uh, uh, on the one hand, we have, uh, let me say, clenching individual. And on the other hand, we have a grinding individual. You could view at these two PSG tracings as the analog of clench or bracing your mandible and grinding your teeth. So they are two different leaves on the same tree. They are two different kind of objects within the same basket. Call them whatever you want, but they are different. They're not the same thing. And that's why the literature has failed so far. So clinically, when you see something like that, and by the way, look at the temporal relationship between the uh, uh, apnea events and the electromyographic events. The respiratory arousals matter in these patients. You are likely to have signs like that. And start asking to uh, Monsieur Robert, on Monday morning, if you see him with toothwear, start asking him something about the possible respiratory disturbances. You will be surprised about that. And you will easily verify that the clinical consequences in terms of TMJ pain are basically always or almost always absent. And the, on the contrary, that he may, uh, this kind of toothwear, of course, is braxin related, but it may be somehow related with uh, uh, apnea or respiratory disturbances. And on the other hand, you have this kind of activity. And this kind of activity reminds me of an individual who is biting his or her life. These are individuals with worries with anxious personalities, with stress sensitivity. Not stress in general. Stress is like the Parmesan. When you don't know what to do, oh, I'm stressed. <laughs> There's a precise, concept, uh, a precise concept in psychology, which is the way, the ability that every one of us has to cope, to face with stress. And you can measure it. And when you measure it, you can easily show that these individuals are the ones who 
bite their lives and who have this kind of muscular activity, which is in turn related, and that's my proposal for today's lecture, related to the possible clinical consequences in terms of signs and symptoms of temporomandibular pain. You got the emotions, you got some sort of, let me say, generically speaking, clenching. It may be mandible bracing, it may be teeth contactic habit or something we have to better clarify in the future. Of course, there's a quote, there's a part of host response. Small mandibles, for instance. They don't have the same uh, tolerability too low that brachycephalic individuals who are able to, to uh, uh, pull trains with their mandibles. So there's a quote of false response to explain the symptoms. But if we start seeing the, the uh, tooth wear and the TMD pain as the results of two different braxes, everything immediately uh, starts fitting in your mind. I was taught, for instance, about the weak chin, uh, uh, weak link, sorry, uh, theory years ago. Uh, an individual who brags, depending on the, the, the weak part of the stomatognatic system, could experience tooth wear or pain in the jaw muscle. Uh, it makes sense from a clinical viewpoint because it was based on, based on the empirical observation that tooth wear is not related with TND pain. So either one or the other one has the possible clinical correlates. But the real uh, issue has nothing to do with uh, the weak link theory. They are simply two different bruxisms. Okay? And to me, the best paper so far able to grasp and to wrap up this kind of concept has been made by Alan Graros a couple of years ago uh, with the AIMA approach. They have been able to correlate uh, um, weak bruxism and uh, muscle tension and psychosocial, psychological distress with the presence uh, of muscle pain. So, uh, for the future, we should also have stopped looking at bruxism as a black and white condition because the etiology is one thing and the clinical consequences are not necessarily related with the etiology. Because we may have some sort of reflex braxis, as in the case of respiratory arousal, that could be protective or at least physiological to a certain extent, but may have negative clinical consequences because the patient may, may experience tooth wear. We could have braxis as part of the physiological sleep architecture. We could have braxis as a uh, wake time behavior that may end up with overload of the jaw muscles. So etiology is on one side of the coin, but the clinical consequences are not necessarily related. So for the future, as member of the, 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 the panel, the works are in progress, the very basic target uh, to transfer our research agenda to the, gen to the dental office is to estimate normality, to try correlating the amount of additive braxism to the clinical consequences. This means that we have to use this kind of fancy devices to establish a normality value of frequency of behaviors how many of us and with which frequency, if otherwise healthy, have the attitude to keep the teeth in contact during the day. We completely miss this normality data, at least as far as the, the standard of references uh, uh, approaches are concerned. And it is only once we have established normality that we are going to be able to define the additive quote of bruxism in terms of muscular activity that is needed to provoke some clinical consequences, whether it be tooth wear, failure of restorations, or temporomandibular disorders. And the same is true for 
sleep praxis. Because among the many studies that have been performed so far, uh, we have not been able to identify the real prevalence of sleep bruxism in terms of the amount of sleep time muscle work. The answer is no, we, are not, we have not been able to do that. So we have to measure bruxism as a continuum during sleep, as a motor activity. And we have to assess bruxism in real time during wakefulness. We miss normality data. I'm an orthodontist, and I became crazy about the correction of the second classes. Because it is the normal in Italy. It is the normality. So we have to study normality to understand the physiopathology. Otherwise, there's a proverb in Italy, but I guess it is worldwide too, that says that if physiology uh, uh, falls asleep, monsters of physiopathologies are created. Coming to the conclusion, uh, of course, I'm really thankful to all my friends throughout the world that helped me draft my ideas uh, performing research. Just a bit uh, uh, of information on our Italian study group. We have many English-speaking congresses. Uh, we have a living legend like Chuck Green in Marina di Carrara uh, on June concerning the myths or orthodontic neonatology. We have a TMD camp in July for those of you who are not willing to relax, but study, 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 and so on. So we are waiting for you. The conclusions. The conclusions of my lecture as a take-home message are that a relationship in terms of one-to-one -one, uh, um, direct causal uh, and cause and effect uh, uh, link between bruxism and signs and symptoms is not supported by the literature. So we have to um, design hypothesis-driven studies to uh, verify on field what I've suggested during this lecture. The etiology is not related with the clinical consequences. We have seen why. And we have to focus on bruxism as different, as an umbrella terms, including different entities in terms of motor activity, etiology, and circadian rate. It is only by doing so that we are going to be able to grasp something concrete uh, in terms of the clinical correlates and not only the neurophysiological or the etiological uh, um, aspects of braxism. So as for sleep braxism, we all agree that polysonography is the standard. It is wonderful to correlate it with the uh, sleep architecture and with what we are doing during sleep. But sleep braxism should be measured. We cannot rely on cutoffs, at least for what we know until now, uh, as a yes or no uh, uh, discrimination between the clinical consequences of braxism. And as for awake braxism, it is hard to measure. Of course, it should be wonderful to, to, to put electrodes on individuals and make them hanging around for eight hours during wakefulness with electrodes, but it is not feasible in everyday life. So it should be assessed uh, indirectly by relying on self-report of the patient via on-time report. And the basis is to gather normality data for use to compare with uh, uh, selected populations of potential clinical consequences. So uh, a very tough future as clinicians and as clinical researchers is ahead of us, but we are all ready to grind our teeth. Thank you.